Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. Welcome back to Edmonton. Hope Thanks, you enjoyed Bruce. your vacation. I did. And I was there. I was in uh, fiery BC, smoke filled BC. Kind of put a crimp on things a little bit, but such is life. Such is well, life. In these end some... times, Bruce, it was the <laughs> these end of days. Yeah, really. We got all the uh, the different pestilences and apocalypses and diseases. Like and, it, doesn't it? Yeah, all seven. Is there seven of them in Moses? Yeah, well, I think there's more now. All right. I saw a cartoon the other day, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the fifth horseman rode up named Disinformation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do our best to provide solid information here today bruce right. we're going to be talking about a few things we'll talk about um Kyler yamamoto's contract situation we're running down the list of prospects and we're going to go uh we're going to talk about the next batch of prospects that we're starting to write about now this includes uh in no particular order tyler benson carter savoy Raphael lavoie and Stuart skinner finally we'll talk about or probably talk about this first it's it's on the tip of everyone's tongues the oilers have brought in a policy in regards to attending games this year and um essentially you got to be double vaccinated if you're that you know there's different ways to get in first thing is be double vaccinated and uh, you have to be double vaccinated for 14 days and apparently, I, I didn't know this, it's quite easy to access your vaccination thing online. They're saying you can go to something called My Health Records. You can, there's an app for it. So that's not going to be hard for people, even if they don't know where their vaccination records are, which I probably have lost mine already. It's still, it's online and it's readily available. The second way to get into a game is um, 48 hours before the game. Uh, or this way to prove taken within 48 hours of the game, you need to get a test. An approved testing from a, now i don't know if this is going to be including rapid tests because uh or if it's all just pcr because rapid tests um might be a lot cheaper and readily available like if you could just get a rapid test that costs two or three bucks i could see people doing that but i, I think a pcr test like more than a hundred dollars 150 so that's unlikely people you know yeah, your ticket that's almost as much as a that's almost as much as a hot dog and a beer at, mm -hmm. at Roger's Place, Bill, Bruce, 150 votes. <laughs> yeah, so I don't probably Nick's burger you know, for that. You could, almost. So I don't <laughs> see people doing that. I'll just give you my quick take on this, Bruce. This is a private sure. company. Mm -hmm. They have a relationship um, with people who work there and with their customers. Uh, I cut a lot of slack for private companies in terms of what they want to do. They mm -hmm. have the, they, it's their, their place, their rules. Mm -hmm. And, um, They've decided, you know, um, that this is the best policy for their customers and their the people who work there. And I, 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 uh, there's a lot of people who are unvaccinated who are going to be really upset by this mm -hmm. and will be going to Oilers games because of this. I know a few, mm -hmm. and I, I respect, I accept their decision to be un unvaccinated, and I, um, you know. I tolerate it. I, I think it's fine. I, I don't have any problem meeting with unvaccinated people. It's not an issue for me. But I understand if, if a business decides otherwise, I believe they have that. I personally believe they have that right to do so. And you have a right then as a customer of that business to say to hell with it, I'm not going. And I think that's how things, this is how things should work. I like it when, when it's done at this kind of level of private individuals, private businesses making their own choices going forward here. My hope is, Bruce, mm -hmm. that shortly we will be th through this this uh, fourth wave that, you know, I, I, I do believe that all the unvaccinated people shortly, are, you know, they're in, this is a highly contagious variant. It's going to go through the population fast and hard and in big numbers. And uh, but my hope is that so sometime this fall that will pass and we'll be in a completely different place, including with the unvaccinated people. Uh, and we'll be able to go forward on a more normal basis. But until then, if businesses want to take these actions, I'm okay with it. What's your position? Well, the businesses are, are indeed. I mean, they're saying they require all of their own employees, volunteers, and contractors to be fully vaccinated. 
uh, with the Health Canada approved vaccine. And I mean, that's a key word right there, Health Canada approved. Uh, you know, the health experts say that this is the way for us to avoid getting sick. And they also say that a critical mass of us getting the vaccine uh, would help all of us avoid getting sick. And certainly the statistics that are out there now say that the unvaccinated folk are at far greater risk uh, than the vaccinated. And it's, uh, you know, it's a sad state of affairs to me that, uh, you know, the advice of the public health authorities is falling on on as many deaf ears as it is. I, I just never anticipated that ever happening in my lifetime, to tell you the truth. But here we are. So uh, you wind up with draconian rules. And of course, whatever gets, whatever gets position gets taken these days, there are hardcore folk against it. And this is on any decision in any matter. It seems like there's, uh, there's such a uh, bifurcation of viewpoints to, uh, to the uh, extremes. And you know, you might say, well, that's my own viewpoint is a extreme viewpoint on one side. And uh, but I, I do believe in the science and I do believe the stats and the numbers and the numbers say what they say. I, I think you're, you're you're pretty mild there, Bruce, in, in terms mm -hmm. of I mean, I, I wouldn't I just have I just think it's personally I feel it's a personal health decision and I'm not going to mm -hmm. I'm not going to I'm not a doctor. Right. I'm not advising anyone else on how mm -hmm. to take care of their personal health. My own hope is that we mm -hmm. can all get vaccinated and open up society again. Right. That's, well, that's yeah. what I, so, so I, no so kidding. That's what we're waiting for. That's, that's why I got vaccinated. Mm -hmm. It's the number one reason. So we could open up again and end this, this, this lockdown, which I think causes a huge amount of harm, just a tremendous amount of harm. And we got to get on with life. Mm -hmm. That said, I under, you know, People, I, I'm not them. It's their personal health decision. There's going to be consequences, though. Yeah. And one of them, I think the, you know, the biggest consequence is getting COVID and getting the full brunt of the disease if you're unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. But another consequence yeah. is that some people are going to decide that they don't want to hang out with you or they don't want you at their establishment. And that's a hard thing. Like, that's yeah. that doesn't feel good to hear that. That That's mm -hmm. going to make people mad, that kind of rejection. And, and the owners are going to lose some hardcore, longtime fans forever. They will write off the Oilers forever. Mm -hmm. This is, I don't imagine this was an easy decision for, for anyone, but they're weighing everything and that's their call. And again, I think they have the right to make that call. So I support them in their, I support their decision and, and it, it wouldn't stop me from going mm -hmm. to the games. Like, you know, uh, uh, just because they're not allowing some people in, mm -hmm. that's not going to stop me from going. I'm going right. to go if I want to go. I'm double vaccinated. I got vaccinated. Partly so I could have this kind of freedom and travel. Mm -hmm. Like there's just no doubt about it, Bruce. Countries around the world are going to bring in these rules. Whether I like well, it or you like it or anyone likes it, they're, to travel, you're going to need to get vaccinated. So it was ever thus. If you, it was know, ever thus. Of the world that if you wanted to go there, you had to show your what they now call vaccine passport. I uh, can't remember what the term was in the day, but your papers, you know, official papers showing you'd had the polio and the smallpox and the whatever. To go to vaccine. Jamaica, I remember I had mm -hmm. to get a couple big shots, and I didn't yeah. even I didn't even think anything of it. This is a little different. This is a different category, mm -hmm. uh, unless we want, I won't get into the why why I think that, but it's you know this is a little bit different than the um, you know the the vaccines that have been around for for much longer. Mm -hmm. All right, let's. Uh, do you have any and uh, final thoughts? Oh uh, well, yeah, I do. I sure would like to see somewhere in this statement that they they've taken steps to install elf. Uh, advanced air filters and such at Rogers Place. That'd be that'd be nice to see that some action was taken on that front. Sure, I don't know if they have or not, and that's again, that's you know, if enough customers want that. Listen, the truth is, I'm not a customer. I don't go to the games, and I'm not buying tickets. So, uh, <laughs> you know, they don't have to listen to me anyway. But maybe enough people, maybe enough real customers. Are who you know pay all that money and I man it is a lot. I talk I talked to one of my yeah. friends who pays ten thousand dollars a ticket uh, oh. to go each year, and uh, that is a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I just I wonder, Bruce. My big question in this is how many fans, how many tickets are they going to sell this year? And I worry we've been in. There's been times in owners' history where they've had 10,000, 11,000 oh, yeah. per game. And and it almost killed the franchise in Edmonton. Now, even with the decade of darkness, we sold a lot of tickets. I th yep. 
people are but people are out of the habit of going to hockey games there's the covid fear yep. and there is our economy which has taken a beating so one of the big you know the the thing that we're not talking about now which is that probably in terms of the health of the franchise the future of the franchise in edmonton is can they sell this place out at the prices they have been charging in recent years in an economy in this world that we have right now, good luck, good luck to them. And I'm hearing a lot of people asking themselves that question, I guess, is why I'm raising it as well. Yeah, well, I've had some fears about this for a while. Like there's a lot of sort of a lot of uh, uh, arrows pointed up in a negative direction. Uh, you mentioned uh, several of them and, you know, just this whole COVID um, uh let's call it a slowdown it's taken all of us off of our rhythm and i'm not sure like i think things like volunteerism are going to be at risk when we get back into full society because people will have lost the momentum and uh you know the, what they're into in their in their lives and it's it's the default has become sit on your butt and your sofa and watch netflix or watch the oilers on tv or you know yeah it's i it's, I, uh, it's, I, I get it I'm going back to coach hockey this year and just the thought of it, Bruce, mm -hmm. I did coach last year, like when there was, right. you know, when the risk of COVID was there, I, I, I was feeling okay though with the, like, I was thinking my personal risk wasn't at the, at the highest level. So I was okay with working with kids and volunteering, but just the thought of going back and volunteering is just exhausting just to think about it because, you know, when you've had this time off, it's, it's kind of nice and you realize, uh, how your life changes when you have more time on your hands and you can just get things live in a more orderly way and things don't fall through the cracks as easily in in all our lives i think when we have more time on our hands and i've been lucky to be employed through this you know a lot of some people haven't so that hasn't been a pressing concern for for me uh but i f really understand the people who are str have struggled with that and there are all kinds of people in that situation yeah it's been a game changer for sure i'm just going to read the last word from the oilers press press release and they are and you know they are in a bit of a pickle so and they say we thank our fans and our team members for their cooperation and ensuring we are able to welcome guests back to rogers place and that's what they're trying to do they're trying to find the right bridge that gap they are not of like some you know it is their decision they have to take they take responsibility mm -hmm. they will yeah. take responsibility mm -hmm. for it in terms of sales but they are not in an easy spot just like anyone who's been a decision maker through this whole covid thing it has been a very difficult balancing act and uh they're going to take some they're going to take some heat they're going to have some really mad people on their hands but i just uh i have a lot of sympathy for anyone who's who's had that pressure of essentially making um life and death decisions on both you know bringing in restrictions getting rid of restrictions because they all these things there's just pluses and minuses of every decision that you make and they're they're weighty so poor oilers on this count bruce the one good thing about them is they mm -hmm. got a better team this year so i think as long as you if you can't sell winning hockey in edmonton you can't sell anything in trouble, yeah. so i think i think we're going to be okay in that so let's let's move on to yamamoto's contract yeah, sure. it's kind of the last um we're not expecting any other pieces of the puzzle to fall and we're not i guess a few ptos of marginal players but um Yamamoto is the last big unsigned player here. And um, what do you make of it, Bruce? What do you think? What do you, what would you like to see in terms of a contract for Yamamoto? What do you, what do you think the club can get? And what do you, what, what do you think the holdup is? Yeah. Uh, what I'd like to see first and foremost is soon get her done. Uh, we, we went through the similar situation last, uh, well, let's call it last off season. It was actually last winter. But they finally got around to signing Ethan Bear after leave, leaving him dangling on the uh, RFA hook for the entire off season. Uh, ultimately, uh, it seems to have possibly affected his training regimen for the season. He wasn't, you know, officially part of the team for all that extra bit of time, and he wound up being it was like that game of musical chairs, you know, where the one person doesn't get a chair. Well. All of a sudden, all the other contracts are signed. There's not much money left. Negoti uh, Yamamoto, like Bear last year, has no real negotiating power. Uh, and the question is, you know, I mean, uh, in one scenario, he signs the Kevin LeBanc contract one year, one million dollars, because he doesn't have, you know, barring a, a, a 
a um, offer sheet, which doesn't seem very likely uh, anywhere in this league right now. Um, I'm sure the Oilers would like to get him locked up for two or possibly three years, and that will cost them more than a million dollars. That will cost them closer to two million, uh, or even maybe a little more if they go for a third year. And that would take him, he's got four RFA years left, and the Oilers would like to lock him up, I'm sure, for at least two of them. So there seems like they're playing a waiting game, but it'd be nice just to get it sorted out and get the, t- the whole team focused on on uh, just getting ready for camp. Good time to make a longer term bet on him, but that costs more money probably. Mm-hmm. So in terms of average annual salary, Bruce, he, he, he is a good time because he, you're buying low, I think right. on Yamamoto. He had fantastic season two seasons ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like lightning in a bottle though, that line coming together with dry Seidel and Nugent Hopkins. We don't know if that will happen again. He, he's, had some real success playing with Dreisaitl, and I have a theory yep. about that. Mm-hmm. He's he's been a good partner with Dreisaitl, and I think if you team them up with Nuge again, I don't know if that's in the plans. There's kind of uh, all kinds of different talk about what they're going to do. They, you know, talk about maybe moving Cassian up to a top line, and I just think, oh, give your head a shake. But um, they could be new. We could have Nuge, Dreisaitl, and Yamamoto again, the Dynamite line reunited. Mm-hmm. I, I want to see that. I just think it's... Just go for it, you know, see, see, start up the year, give them a training camp, commit to that for the first 10 games and see what happens. Now, if that happens and he starts scoring a point a game like he did when, when he was on that line, it was going great. Yamamoto is a much more expensive hockey player. I'd like to sign it, see him sign at least a two-year deal. And and my bet is it'll be a two-year deal. And, mm-hmm. and, um, I, I don't really have a dollar amount, but, uh, you know, he, he, the reason I think he plays so well with, with Dreisaitl in terms mm-hmm. of goals plus minus, which has been consistent over two seasons. Yep, sure has. I think Yamamoto is an extremely smart defensive hockey player. So do and I. I noticed this when he played with McDavid and Dreisaitl. Two guys who, for all they offer as, as hockey players, will cheat often for offense. Especially when they're on the ice together, Bruce. They both like to put up the points. And Dreisaitl will freelance in the defensive zone, going for the steal, the big steal mm-hmm. of the puck. And and McDavid will wander now and then up the ice to get that pass. And uh, who's covering for them? Kyler Yamamoto. He very often, you watch the tape, go back and watch it if you don't believe me. Mm-hmm. Very often playing the center position um, in front of the net is Kyler Yamamoto, the smallest of those guys. But he is all over those guys in the slot. And he covers it off. I'm just, mm-hmm. I am just really love the way... Uh, he fills in there. So I think he's a great fit with dry settle because he mm-hmm. dry Leon, he likes to freelance. So, um, and Yamamoto's Yamamoto's and it often works, right? Cause he's such yeah. a smart hockey player, but, um, it's good to have that security blanket and cutter Yamamoto provides it. Yeah. Well, I mean, compare and contrast the time, uh, at the end of, uh, uh, calendar 2019 when uh, McDavid and Drysaddle were together, but they had Cassian on their wing, and they were just bleeding goals against even <laughs> faster than they could score them, which is saying a lot. Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, whereas with Yamamoto last year, the three of them, when they played together, they scored 12 and allowed two. And that was in like over two hours of hockey, right, where they not only scored five goals an hour, but they gave up less than one. And they that's new for that particular combination and Yamamoto deserves certainly some of the credit. I mean, some of it's just luck and averages and things that, you know, small samples. Uh, but uh, some of it is uh, Yamamoto is a, is a uh, to my eye, a uh, already a, a plus defensive player and he's got a very real chance to become an elite defensive player. I really like his skill set, uh, his, his aggression on the puck. Uh, you know, uh, on the forward check, but also uh, in the defensive zone. He's got an excellent stick for picking off passes. He's got an excellent head for reading the lanes, shooting and passing lanes both. And he's fearless. He'll get in those lanes. He'll block shots. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll uh, you know, take on the guy, even the guy that outweighs him by 40 or 50 pounds or 75 pounds for that matter. And 
he, you know, he, my concern about the guy is more that can he take the pounding that he's going to take? And last year, as the season went along, he became less and less effective. And he was taking more and more maintenance days and he missed a, you know, a couple of games here and a couple of games there with some kind of thing, which was never made clear. But, uh, you know, I think it affected his, uh, his game most likely in the, in the second half of the season. And the question is, is it a one-off that he's going to be healthy this year and no problem? Or is that something that he's going to get banged up regularly? And we don't know. We don't know. And, um, yeah, he he only scored what was it, one goal in the last twenty eight games or something like that. It was uh, twenty five of the regular season, and then he went oh oh and one assist in the four playoff games. Yikes! Yeah. Yikes! Yikes! Yeah. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing, Bruce, when we think about when I think about players who are solid in the defensive slot, mm-hmm. it's it's the way they're thinking the game. Mm-hmm. They're just they're sure. they're reading the game well, and they have the proper discipline to understand their role. It's mm-hmm. just to play defense there. That's all you're thinking about. You're not thinking about anything else. You're just focused on what's happening and you're reading the play and then you get in the right spot. And it's two little guys, Yamamoto and Gaetan Haas, who stand out to me as the best slot defenders in terms of playing that that center position um, in the defensive zone in recent years. You don't have to be huge to get the job done. And a player like Cassian, who is huge, he's just you know terrible at it. And Kyle Torres, who's average size, you know, he really, really struggled. There's talk of tourists making the team again this year and he's working hard, I guess. And, you know, when I think of what he can do, like, I just don't, I have zero faith in his ability to make the reads and cover off defensively as a center. Now, maybe he could be, maybe if he just totally revamped his game, he could get it done as a winger Mm -hmm. on the fourth line and then add some scoring. Maybe that's a role for him, but, you know, I don't think it's that easy. It it just takes a really high understanding of the game and a real discipline yeah. about playing your position, perfecting uh, your defensive position and understanding it. And not all the players attain that level of defensive play. One of the things Yamamoto gets that a lot of them don't, to me, is he knows when to actually leave and leave his position, and he will recognize when he's a right winger covering the left defenseman. And the two, his own two defensemen and his center get sucked into a corner and there's a guy left in front of the net. He, he won't be standing up by the point man saying, hey, I got my man. What are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah. He'll actually dip down into the slot and get that yes. stick out there and pick off that pass. He made a, an, I don't know how big the number was, but a number of brilliant, to my eye, defensive plays last year. It was just kind of an emergency, winger covering the slot because no one else was around. And he... Uh, he he impresses me in that. And I mean, he's, this is still a young player, right? 22 years old. We'll see where he takes that. But I, I like his chances of being a first-rate defensive player. And frankly, I'd like to see him killing more penalties. It's interesting, eh? Because, uh, you know, there's other players on these top lines like Nuge and Hopkins and Pulley Arvey. And I, I think that uh, Nuge is a pretty good defensive winger. Mm-hmm. And Pulley Arvey is a pretty good defensive winger, but they both, I can both recall situations where the, where they lose their players in the slot, where they don't cover it up. There was one in the playoffs where Pulley Arvey got beat and they're both pretty good, but it's funny that it's the little guy, the smallest of the, of the bunch who really uh, packs a wall up as a defensive player. So good for Kyler Yamamoto. And, and, and that's why I'm probably a little more bullish. He has his detractors and because mm-hmm. the point scoring dropped. Right. Uh, but I'm, I'm a little bit more positive about this player because of that defensive aspect of his game. So I, I see him as a very, listen, even if he, in a full regular season and, he, and he's not on the power play, if he scores 35, 40 points and he's on the second line, I think he's probably really doing his job because right. that's a lot of, that's a decent amount of even strength scoring. Mm-hmm. And in the defensive end, you know that he's really helping out. So. Right on. Well, that's the one good thing out of all this for the Oilers. Uh, you, you alluded to this earlier. Nugent Hopkins and Yamamoto were both excellent in 1920 down the stretch, but they each had a year to run on their contract. So that didn't wind up being the platform yeah. season that they were negotiating on because they both would have got a lot bigger raise than they're going to wind up Ooh. getting. So from a team's perspective, if they'd flipped those two years around and they were negotiating now off of what they did last year, there would be... Uh, there wouldn't be enough cash in the kitty. Nuge would have got seven million a year, and um, Yamamoto yeah. would be getting a pretty good bundle as well. 
it'd be start with a three. Probably. Bruce, let's move on and let's start yep. talking about the prospects. Uh, sure. we'll, we will start with, let's just start with Raphael Lavoie. He's listed on Hockey DB as 6'3", 205. I'm guessing he's bigger than that now. Um, certainly in weight. 6'4", 198 says elite prospects, but uh, he's tall okay. and he has room to thicken. So he's going to be a big boy before he's done. There's no question. Yeah, he already is. And yeah. uh, he's going to get bigger. So so uh, he spent uh, four seasons in the in the queue. And, you know, had to realize his potential there became a, you know, he was for the last uh, three years, he was a top line winger on his team. And the last year he was on the Canadian U20 World Junior Team. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he was drafted by the Oilers 38th uh, overall in the 2019 draft and um, split split last year. He was one of the many players, Bruce, who, to their great credit, the Oilers Mm -hmm. placed overseas. They didn't waste a season on, I don't think any player on the roster had that horrible, I guess Marodi only played the one game, but they tried with him. They, they, they did a great job of placing all these players during the COVID lockdown in uh, Europe. And he went to VASB, a Div 2 team, Swedish Division 1, they call it, but it's, it's their second division hockey. VASB, which was a terrible team, and he was the best player on it. I think he scored uh, 45 points in 51 games. Then he went to Bakersfield for the uh, final part of the season. 10 points in 19 regular season games and four points in six playoff games. He was part of the team that, you know, won uh, the Pacific Division title for Bakersfield, which was a big moment for all those players. Bruce, I'm really bullish on this player. What's Mm -hmm. your take? Lots to like for sure. I mean, he's got lots of rough edges and and we got to remember he's still, uh, uh, what, 19 years old. Is he or no, he's 20 now. And he's, you know, he's just a kid, though. I mean, he's still just at the very beginning. He's got uh, he's got two more years to run on his entry level contract. And for a second round draft choice, you know, you don't expect him to quite be knocking on the NHL door at this point. But what you do expect is progress. And I think we are seeing progress. He came 12th in the hockey all Spenskin uh, in scoring uh, behind about nine Swedes. And he, uh, uh, he he was the top scoring Canadian in that league. Let's put it that way. And he was he was to my eye in the games I watched, which mind you were focused on his shifts. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, service that we had, you were able to just watch the shifts of the player you were interested in. So, uh, but by eye, he was the best player on that team. And by stat, he you know he scored 45 points, and then only had one other guy who even got to 30 on uh, on uh, uh, Vasby. Uh, he's he's big and gangly. He doesn't like strike me as being a great skater, but he can get from A to B. And, uh, you know, in terms of the player style, I don't want to make this comp like willy-nilly, but the style of player he reminds me of is Dave Andrechuk, who wound up being a pretty good NHL player <laughs> for a lot of years, you know, being big and gangly and right-handed shot. That was a shooter that knew where to go in the, in the offensive zone. And he knew how to get a shot away and on the net. And that's, I mean, Lavoie has got the sort of the fundamentals of that. And also the plenty of rough edges and, uh, you know, the, uh, um, uh, like he's not a player that I ever envisioned as being a great defensive player. Like we were just talking about, uh, potential of being, you know, uh, his his potential is is offensive, but even those players have to be able to hold their own enough defensively that they're not giving it all back. So he's got he's got a lot of work to do, and this year he'll be starting presumably if all gets going on schedule in Bakersfield with Jay Woodcroft, and uh, as opposed to being airlifted in even later in the season than the other guys who came back from Europe, because he actually finished out the season in Vasby before he came over. Right. Whereas Mm -hmm. some of the other guys like Benson and so on that uh, came back in time for Oilers training camp and then went on to the AHL and were there on day one. Well, that wasn't Lavoie. 
and he hit the ground running. He had a he had a streak and he had a cold streak. Like he, he is he is really hot and cold. But in the playoffs, he was pretty good. And he was they put him with two real vets. Uh, I think it was Malone and uh, Cracknell, wasn't it? That was on his line because uh, they had um, they had Marodi and Benson on on a, on a different line. Uh, anyway, he he uh, he clicked with those vets, and it was a real nice experience for the kid. Uh, uh, to play with those guys and and you know tough one goal playoff games every game they won was by one goal uh, three of the four in overtime and they faced elimination on three different occasions and came through with wins and I mean you might say well it's just a little it's not even the Allen Cup it's just a little little thing they did at the end of the season but hey those are great experiences and I probably said this last podcast, and I'll probably say it again next podcast. But you know, I'm glad those kids got that chance, and I'm glad they came through. He reminds me, Bruce. Like I can see around the net, he's a bit like Andre Chuck. Like he really, he's more of a. He reminds me more of James Neal. Mm-hmm. Straight line, big, tough, nasty uh, winger who's got a hell of a shot. And goes in straight lines to the net. And James Neal in his prime, that was him. That's the kind of player he was. So I think the, potentially Lavoie can be James Neal in the at the NHL level. That's the ceiling that for him, I would say. He works. he um the skating isn't great. And if it was, he would have been taken first overall. Like I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's got everything, he's got a hell of a shot, he's mean. He, he does he, have a nasty streak, eh? Yeah. He got suspended. Jeez. He got suspended in Sweden, I think, a couple of times for not taking crap from some opponent or other. But, yeah, he's a he's a tough guy, and yeah. uh, so I like this player a lot. I I, I think he's got a. He, the Oilers need some shooters. Like they don't mm-hmm. really have. The closest they have is what Pulley Arvi, I guess. You know, if he if he continues to develop as a shooter, he's got some ways, got a way to go. I mean, Dry Settle is obviously a shooter. But he's also a center. Sorry. But they need some shooters on the wing to play with McDavid and Drysaddle. Some guys who can just fire it in the net. Yeah. And in this on this list, we have two of them: Carter Savoy and and um, right. Raphael Lavoie. So that's the potential. He's going to spend the full year in Bakersfield. I was just I've just been trying yeah. to call up my um, Bakersfield roster, and I just cannot seem to get the correct one. But I think he he'll be top line this year in Bakersfield. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And uh, I don't know who is for sure. Top six. That you know, Maximov's there. He's there. Um, we'll see who else is there. Got some printing going on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bruce Carter Savoy. What do you make of him? Uh yeah, Savoy. Uh, he's part of my triple-headed dream. My dream is that Raphael Lavoie makes the Oilers. That Carter Savoy makes the Oilers. And that Rod Phillips comes out of retirement to announce them when they play on the same line together. Lavoie and Savoy. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> I fear it will remain a dream. Rod Phillips is uh, uh, still around, but uh, he hasn't called a hockey game for a good long time. But uh, anytime you get these tongue twisters of names, I, uh, I default to Rod Phillips. <laughs> so, yes, what do I think of Carter Savoy? He's a sniper. He's a shooter. And he is a smaller left-handed uh, version of Raphael uh, Lavoie. And he uh, he likes to, uh, uh, you know, his first um, instinct is to get the puck on the net. Uh, he put up a, a very uh, fine first season, University of Denver, especially hot uh, out of the gate. But he wound up playing 24 games with 13 goals, 7 assists, 20 points. Uh, pretty good year there, and and he uh, 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 was just kind of a pleasant surprise right out of right out of the gate. He led the team by a mile in goals. Um, he was the only double digit scorer on the team, second in points, and this is as a freshman. And you know he was uh, he was an important player for them, uh, University of Denver too. Like that's uh, a very significant program. That they got going on. So a very, very good step for a kid who had played always pretty close to home uh, before then. And uh, I mean, he played right here in in uh, uh, northern Alberta, 
uh, his whole uh, with the Alberta Junior Hockey League career with the with the uh, Sherwood Park Crusaders. And I think he, as far as I know, he's, he lived at home the whole time. I know some of the criticism of him was things like, I don't know, diet and just just a, that he's a little bit soft and and that like physically and that that opportunity and this challenge of of moving a long way from home and taking on a, you know a, a higher level and it sounds like he's responded to that nicely so super skilled hockey player just yeah. great with the puck magic hands incredible shot wrist shot can really fire the puck and pass the puck great vision on the ice He's not the fastest skater. And again, if he was, he would have been taken in the first round, not the fourth right. round. And some right. people had him actually rated towards the end of the, towards the high second round, end of the first round. Like a few people, I think Scott Wheeler of The Athletic, if I recall correctly, was really bullish on this player in his draft year. You know, so he comes out of the AHL where he's got 99 points in 54 games. I think he's led the league in scoring. He's just been great. Uh, 53 goals in 54 games oh. in that final year. So he's just great. But you, the question is, how's this kid going to do against right. bigger, older players? And he just went to the University of Denver and he crushed it. Mm -hmm. He was their top attacking threat um, this year, firing the puck. And, um, you know, he, he got off to a great start and then slowed down a little bit. But he, his first year is the kind of year that if your first draft round draft pick had out of the AJHL in U.S. college hockey, you'd think, oh, he's progressing nicely, our first-round draft pick. Well, this was a guy taken in the fourth round, 100th yeah. overall. So this is this is found money, you know, if he mm -hmm. can keep this up. So what I'd like to see this year, it, it would be great if he can challenge for the league lead in scoring, if he can continue the momentum and take a, yet another step um, mm -hmm. higher. And that'll partly dependent on teammates stepping up. This was, uh, the University of Denver wasn't a particularly strong team last year in that league. But if he can take it up one more notch here, the Oilers might really have something, Bruce. So I think he'll be in the University of Denver one more year at least. Sure. But I could see him turning pro after that. Like if he has a big season where he's got, let's say they play 30 games and he's got 40, 45 points, something like that, 40 points. But that would be pretty tremendous. Um, 40 points would be tremendous. And, but I think he's capable of it. This guy mm -hmm. can really, really attack. And again, he's what the Oilers need. He's in a scoring winger. So big year. It's a big year for all these prospects. But right. uh, I was a little surprised he wasn't invited to Team Canada to try out for the World Junior Team. Um, I think he, he qualifies. And, and I, you know, the year he had at U.S. College Hockey. Yeah. They invited Tyler Tulio. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't they invite Carter Savoy? So mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's a little bit of prejudice against two things. It, you know, didn't play major junior, played just yep. uh, junior A, mm -hmm. and did, isn't playing major junior, playing U.S. college hockey. Right, chose but U.S. over Canada. He could score, you know, yeah. he could score a big goal. He, yeah. he definitely could score a big goal, so... You know, we'll we'll see. I think that's a mistake, honestly. They should have invited him. Yeah, well, most years, uh, Team Canada, the World Juniors, has maybe one U.S. college player on it. And I know that more than 5% of the top players are 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 playing down there. But there's, uh, uh, to me, there's an uh, um, intrinsic bias within Hockey Canada. And uh, to go with the guys I know, I mean, they're, they're, they are very much... Uh, the CHL is their primary partner there, and they just tend to go in that direction. Now, you mentioned Tyler Tulio. Uh, this, the jury's real, real early on this, but this could be Ken Holland's greatest trade as an Oilers general manager to this point. And that is when he traded down in the uh, uh, 2020 draft. He had, he had the 76 selection, and he traded for number 100 and 126. And he took... Um, uh, Carter Savoy with number 100 and Ty Tulio with 126. And I said at the time, and I've seen nothing since to, to change my mind, that I would have been happy with either of them had they just kept 76 and picked that guy there. Like, I think they got two real good picks for, for where they got him, fourth and fifth round. And both those guys, you know, I mean, we just wrote about Tulio as number, our number 13 uh, prospect. And uh, 
as this podcast goes to air, we know that uh, Savoy is going to be listed somewhere in the top 10 because we're talking about prospects 10 through 7 today. So taken 76th overall that year was San Jose used that pick to take a Russian player called Daniel uh, Gushin, who plays for Muskegon in the USHL and, and had a really good scoring season. So, I mean, of course, they could have taken any number of players. It's, we'll see, though. If, but two uh, picks for one. If, but, you know, if you I cash that, on both picks, you're doing, you know, and they haven't cashed, but they got two good, real good prospects for where they got them. So that trade, I mean, the, the, the trade itself was was good, but what made it real good was the fact that they made two good picks thereafter, and obviously we won't know the the final answer for many years from now, but uh, things are trending nicely. Tyler Benson. Tyler mm. Benson, Bruce. Tyler Benson. Mm. Taken second round, 32nd overall in the 2016 draft. That is a long, long time ago for a prospect. Yep. He has been in Bakersfield three years, and his first year, he just had a stellar year, 66 points in 68 games. He he looked like he was going to, you know, maybe even make the Oilers in the following year, but he took a step back in Bakersfield a little bit, 36 points in 47 games the next year, and then in the, you know, which was called off, he didn't have a chance in the playoffs. I don't know if Bakersfield would have made the playoffs. He had seven games in Edmonton, so we have seen him as an Oiler. He had one assist. I liked him as an oiler. I thought he was solid defensively and added on the attack. Last season, he played in the Swiss, I think the Swiss second division, if I'm not mistaken, for the GCK Lions, 19 points in 15 games. And then he went over to Bakersfield where he lit it up again. He and yep. he and Marodi yep. and McLeod formed the dynamic, probably the best attacking line in the HL last season. 36 points in 36 games plus 14 and uh, his playoffs were okay. I, I, he had good games and 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 bad games. I, I guess the knock on him has been his skating. I think Kurt Levins has pointed this out a number of times. He just isn't a. He's not a. He's no Pavel Bure out there, Bruce. Mm -hmm. And he he will can he skate fast enough? He thinks the game well enough on the attack mm -hmm. and I think on defense. And he's strong on the boards. He can really pass mm -hmm. the puck. I, I think he might be a nice fit with a player like Drysaddle who can really shoot. Um, setting up Drysaddle, I, I, I think they could have some chemistry there. Of course, they have Ryan Nugent Hopkins on an eight-year contract. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, I, I don't know if he's going to get his chance this year, Bruce. He, I think he would have, without COVID, he would have been called yeah. up last year and he would have yes. got a chance. So it's just a terrible uh, thing that yes. happened to him in terms of his career because of COVID. Well, do you think he can make it? He's not had good luck, that's for sure. Yeah. I had a lot of trouble with injuries in his younger years. Like he was a true hotshot prospect as a, as a youngster. Broke all of Ty Ratty's records in uh, uh, midget hockey here in Alberta. But uh, he um, uh, he ran into a, a couple of health issues while he was with the Vancouver Giants. And he, he lost just big chunks of multiple seasons. That really set him back. And I think his off-season training and all of it was set back, uh, which presumably would also have included, you know, work with the skating coaches and and uh, what have you. Uh, I can't comment knowledgeably enough on his skating to say, you know, I mean, I hear some people just say, ah, oh, he just can't skate. He ain't going to make it. He can't skate. And I'm not there at all. Uh, I, let's see him play some games. Let's see the guy get a, get a shot. Uh because he's now on his second contract uh, and he signed a team-friendly contract at the NHL minimum, even though his qualifying offer was for more than that, he took the minimum because that's his best chance is to get in on, into the roster where he's not costing the team against any margin at all and he's right at the, at the very bottom level. Uh, and they can't, uh, they can't just send him down to the minors uh, with impunity. they got to waive him now. And so... They, he has sort of two chances. One is that some other team might claim him if he gets put on waivers. But two, and they're the better of those chances that the orders don't want to waive him because they don't want to lose a guy they've invested five years and three three directly development years in on a second round draft pick who's done 
proven what he's done at the minor league level. Like the, I think he fits somewhere in the roster, and it might be as a fourth line left winger, and it might be as a thirteenth forward, or you know. But uh, I think he he has a real good chance to start the season on the on the team. The question is, will he get games? And secondly, will he get games in a place where he can really show? You know, like as an offensive player, if you put him on the uh, on the uh, on line with uh, uh, with Devin Shore, you know, like maybe he's not really going to produce a whole lot of points, right? But if you give him so, and there's so much competition here. I mean, they just signed, as you say, Nuge to an eight-year deal. Zach Hyman, also a left winger, listed uh, to a seven-year deal, and they just brought in Warren Fogel, left winger, signed him to a three-year deal, and all of a sudden you're Tyler Benson, and you're looking at the roster, and your gaze has just gone up and up and up at all these roadblocks. So, and uh, they got uh, Dylan Holloway, yeah. Bruce, steaming up. Yeah. You know, he can play left wing. They and they signed yeah. Perlini. They yeah. signed Devin Shore. Yeah. So I, there's yeah. one job there: fourth line mm-hmm. left wing, right? Mm-hmm. And it yeah. looks like there's Perlini, right. Shore, Holloway. Me. Benson, there's four guys battling for one spot. And in terms of being a checker, I can't I can't speak to Perlini's game. So mm-hmm. I so I'm not gonna try. But um if it's just if they just want a checker and so a penalty killer, they're gonna go with Devin Shore, right? Yeah. But Benson can check. And if they want a bit more offense, which I don't think they will, um, I, I see Devin Shore making it ahead of I, I see Holloway going to um Bakersfield. Yeah, sighted. And I see now, now there's a chance that the Benson will stick though as the 13th or 14th forward on the team or that Shore will. But I, I just want to see Benson get 10 games in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. let's see what we got so nice. before you give up on this player. And and give him a few games on a top line. Give him a few games with some good some high caliber NHL players like Dry Saddle or McDavid. And let's see how he does there because th- this guy can really really pass the puck. He's got great vision, and he's he, that's his he, it's his elite NHL skill, and I'd love to see him setting up Leon Drysaddle. So I hope to see that in a few games. Maybe we'll see it. Maybe we won't. Did you know if they maybe they're going to move Nuge to center for a little bit? Unlike, I was just but, that. but if if that's the case, you know I wouldn't mind seeing Benson with Nuge. Um, mm-hmm. They're both kind of similar players in some ways. Nuge is a better skater, of course much better skater, but they're, they're, they're cerebral players who really love to pass the puck. They play the give and go game very well, but, um, that, that is Benson's game. And, and there's other players on the owners who excel at that dry settle Yamamoto, uh, Nugent Hopkins. So if he's in the mix with those guys now and then on a line that might right. work. Well, where he clicked best at the minor league level was when he was playing with skilled line mates. Right. Yeah. And when Marodi was healthy was when Benson was better. When Marodi was was struggling with injury uh, in the middle of the year, was coincidentally or otherwise, that was the time that uh, Benson struggled. And when they had a talented center in the middle of them, that line really hummed. And I mean, obviously in the minors, it's, it's a lot easier to get into the top six uh, than it is at the NHL level. But but that's my my worry is that if he makes the team and yet still does he get a chance to really play with skilled players? Because that's where uh, he's most likely to excel. Yeah, I think Kurt's written recently, you know, he's got to improve his skater, take up skating, uh, take up the challenge and improve his skating. And uh, that's possible. You know, you know, I remember hearing about Braden Point uh, coming in as a 20-year-old and working hard on his skating and becoming an elite sure. skater at the NHL level. So it, it can be done, but it, you know, takes superhuman effort and... Uh, mm-hmm. We'll see what happens there. Bruce, the last player on our list for today is Stuart Skinner. Stuart Skinner taken third round, uh, 2017, 78th overall. Um, he was he was a, a strong he for I think five years, four or five years in the uh, Western Hockey League from 2014, 15 to 2017, 18. So that's four years. He was a strong goalie at the WHL level he had but he had some good he kind of had up and down years as a pro hockey player in the last three seasons he started out pretty down and he had some seasons I think that are they're haunting him a little bit in terms of how the organization 
views him. I don't like he's not necessarily seen as the heir apparent or a lock to ever make this make the Oilers. I don't believe he's not talked about that by the hockey insiders uh, in that light. He, you know, as as the guy who's going to one day take over him from Mike Smith. There is more positive buzz about him, though, because last year in 31 games, he had a nine nine fourteen save percentage uh, for for the uh, Bakersfield Condors. And it was a significant turnaround. I think in part, Bruce, their defense was a lot better last year. They brought in Ryan Stanton, who is a really, really good AHL defenseman. And I think he helped settle down that uh, defensive group. You know, he became, you know, their their horse and Gravel, Kevin Gravel. They had two guys who could really play well at the AHL level. And that helped Stuart Skinner as much as anything. But he did have this good year. So he, the, the good news is, although he's had three pro seasons goalies get four seasons before they have to go on waivers. So the owners can send him back for another year in Bakersfield and he doesn't have to go on waivers front. So another team can claim him. So this is, um, this gives the owners this, this window here. Um, as Koskinen's contract comes to an end this season and they're looking for someone. If, if Stuart Skinner has another, if he gets a year where he's around nine twenty, he could be definitely in the running to, uh, take over from Miko Koskinen. So, Big year for him. Yeah, he came down. Uh, well, he, he he started the year with Edmonton on the yeah. taxi squad. Had that and game. That, and uh, he wound up being the backup because um, Smith got hurt and Forsberg got waived and lost on waivers. And all of a sudden, uh, Skinner went from number four to number two in a two-day span. And he backed up Koskinen for a number of games. And then uh, he, he finally did get to start one game. And so he got down to Bakersfield a little bit late. And they were already, uh, I think, 0-3 when he got there. They started, they had a weird year. They started off with five straight losses and they turned it around. And he was a huge part of the turnaround because he won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games in a row at one point. And he barely gave in any goals. Uh, he was just, uh, uh, you know, Shutouts, he had back-to-back shutouts. He had a whole bunch of one-goal-against kind of games. And so he had great stats for a while. And he, he kind of um, regressed uh, towards the mean, but he still had a pretty fine season when all was said and done with a uh, uh, 914, a 238. And I believe he led the league in, in wins, 20 wins, uh, nine losses, nine regular-type losses. And... and uh, uh, he uh, he showed a lot, and of course he played well in the playoffs. You know, all those low-scoring overtime games. Well, he was in the nets, not giving in the goal that would have eliminated them from the playoffs. A couple of situations. So uh, uh, it was uh, it was a uh, I think promising year for him, uh, and he was the only guy really in the order's top prospects who could have been loaned to Europe, who wasn't. He stayed here, but he got the, he still got the oh, double experiences. He got the one in Edmonton, and then he got the you know serious playing time and the good results down in Bakersfield. So I view it as a real step forward season for uh, Stuart Skinner. Maybe he was here working with a goalie coach, and um, that was the right thing for his development, like as opposed to playing games in Europe. It's hard. To, I don't Not know. What a lot of goalies went over. Rodrigue was kind of the exception to the rule, and and I know. I mean, maybe the, 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 I didn't study like all what all the teams did with their players, but uh, uh, not too many goalies seem to be uh, flying the pond. But uh, Rodrigue did, and he played a bunch of games. He played over twenty games in uh, in uh, in the Austrian league. But um, Skinner stayed here. But he, like I say, he was. He was right in there with the orders for the first uh, month of the season. And so he uh, he got sort of two different types of development uh, during during the course of the season. So he, he uh, uh, one thing you can say about almost all of the orders prospects, it was not, not just a normal year where they developed, they stayed with one team and they just played with that team all year. There's a couple, you know, went to, went to Russia and just stayed there, but mostly they... Uh, uh, they got uh, uh, different perspectives on the uh, pro hockey life. Let's put it that way. So this year in Bakersfield, he's up against Ilya Konovalov and Olivier Rodrigue for playing time. It's pretty clear that one of those guys is going to be sent to an ECHL team. 
And um, there's also Staylock, who's here. Yeah. Right? Now, he could be sent down. And, and now, if he's sent down, I don't think that that makes a problem for either Konovalov or Skinner. You could have two then, two goalies in the ECHL. If you went that route, and I, I wouldn't see Stalock as the, the number one goalie in Bakersfield, but he could play, he could be the backup and stay sharp, get some games in case there was an injury in Edmonton. And then they might call up Stalock again. Um, I don't, I think Stalock would probably go make it through waivers, I'm guessing. So uh, it's, it's a little bit complicated for playing time, but I see Skinner's going to get his games. He was the number one guy last year. He, he, mm-hmm. as you say, he was, he was, the guy in the in between the nets and the playoffs would go goes a long way on a team in terms of securing your future with that team if you come up big as the goalie in the playoffs and are part of a, a winning team so uh he's going to get his games we'll see what happens to all the other guys um a little bit more concerned about rodrigue's development and kind of but there's lots of playing in the echl there's lots of games to be played too so mm-hmm. they'll get their chances yeah, lots of Oilers goalies over the years have spent time in the in the ECHL, uh, including Skinner, but also including you know guys like Devin Dubnik and uh, um, uh, Jeff Delorier that they were you know sort of high profile goalies, and that's sort of the first step for many of them was year one they'd be in the ECHL. What would be different for Rodriguez? This would be year two because of the sudden surfeit of goalies they have in the organization with Konovalov coming on board and with Stalock being in the mix, it's, uh, uh, there might be a three headed monster somewhere in the chain. And I'm actually thinking that might happen at Bakersfield. We'll see. Bruce, let's just end off. I just want to ask you, I I was away on vacation for a little while. Mm -hmm. Nothing has happened with Chase on or Annis, right? They're both kind of floating out there in the unemployment sphere. For hockey players and looking for jobs, I, Chase on is a, would be a good fourth line signing for some team. You know, I think I I wouldn't. I I like the player. Of, fine, I don't think it's going to be an Edmonton though at this point, is it? Uh, it seems unlikely. You know, I mean, they protected four right wingers, right? Yeah. And he he didn't have a contract, so he wasn't one of them. And there's just not the aching need for uh, uh, for right wing. Uh, as we know, uh, he did a lot of his best work on the power play, and I do think that they're planning to slot Zach Hyman in there. And uh, uh, yes, Paul Diarvi showed something last year as a possible net front guy. So even though Neil is gone, I think it's it, it's looking more likely Neil and Chase on are uh, are gone. And I agree with you; he could he could help some team. Uh, he may wind up following the same path he did three years ago when he came to the Oilers camp on a uh, professional tryout, signed a one-year deal for league minimum, and in some ways that was his best year in Edmonton, but it sure was his most, uh, 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 the, the one year that they really got a huge value contract out of the guy because they paid him thereafter. And so, But I could see him easily going to some team on a PTO and making that team out of camp. Indeed. Yeah, they got Hyman and Pulley RV. So, all right. Well, uh, any uh, final thoughts, Bruce? Are we good to go? <sighs> it's still August. September's coming. Camp, the whole camp is delayed, delayed. by about a week. Eh? Yeah. It's, it, but it's only a week. I mean, the season ended a month late. The draft was a month late. Uh, but the new season, the rookie camp gets underway on September 15th, which is traditionally when main camp starts. The main camp this year starts on the 22nd, and the first game for the Oilers is October 13th, so about a week behind the, you know, typically the first week of October, they start her up. So to trying to get her back into uh, um, the regular rhythm of hockey again, and, I mean, we'll see where this fourth wave goes and when the fifth wave comes and you know there's there's just so much it would be so nice just to play a season like 82 games you know that kind of season and several playoff rounds Oilers so it would be very nice It'd be very nice oh yeah <laughs> I'm worried about minor hockey again we can't have uh, that that we had last year with you gotta anyway we'll see what happens okay Syrah Syrah Bruce right. thanks for talking today Well, thanks for listening, everyone.
And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>